Hey, hello. I want to plead that you watch this video till the end. If you don't watch till the end, you will misunderstand what I am talking about in this video. Thank you and God bless you. So if I have at any point in my life accepted Christ into my life as Lord and Savior, said the salvation prayer. Irrespective of how I've lived my life on earth, you are saying that I am going to spend eternity with God. The condition for spending eternity with God is to receive Christ. What now happens to the place of the wages of sin is death. I'm a believer, but I have not let go of the ways of sin. You know, some of us believe we can put one leg here, one leg there. What then happens in the afterlife where, you know, I've been living in sin as a Christian, I died. What now happens to that context of one sin and every sin? Am I going to heaven in spite of all this? So there are two things. The first thing is, there are people who are in churches who say they are saved, but they are false brethren. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus, wherever you are listening to me from. I want to register my profound appreciation and gratitude to you all, those of you who have been here with us for years, and I will still see you once and again. God bless you. And in case you are new, uh, thank you very much. Without you guys out there, we will not be here doing what we are doing. Thank you for your contributions those of you who like and share who make your contributions you know in the comments areas and uh even those who disagree vehemently and sometimes with insults we appreciate you and those who are gracious in their choice of words and um even when they disagree with what we are we're projecting thank you so much and god bless you now i want to ask please don't relent keep cheering keep liking keep commenting and keep being a christian in the name of our lord jesus christ once again i want to appeal to you if you have been coming and you have not subscribed kindly give us your subscription and uh, you can always unsubscribe whenever you think you know you're not getting what brought you and would like it would appreciate it if you also make us understand the areas we are not doing it well now the only areas that are non-negotiable is that you cannot tell us you know what to say when it comes to the things we are convinced now but you can advise us on how to say it that is perfect thank you and god bless you now we're going to listen to this video i will not interrupt you this was an interview granted by Dr. Eber Damina, see bothering on eternal salvation. Now, there are salient points that he raised in this video that we would be looking at at the end of the video. Largely, he said, you know, some things that are remarkable and that are very, very um, true. But then I fear that there are some areas that we also have to look at check. Now, for those of you who are his followers and members, and you don't agree at all when anybody disputes or disagrees with Eber Damina just because of how highly you have rated him and you think that he is, you know, the final authority when it has to do with the gospel and the Bible, um, don't be emotional. Just stick around and see where we're coming from. Thank you and God bless you. I'll be with you. Um, the video will play right after this time out. I'll be seeing you at the end of the video. Thank you. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the End Time to Television channel. We urge you to subscribe to the channel, activate the bell icon by selecting all so that the next time we upload a new video, you will be among the first persons to be notified by Google. I'll be seeing you in the next video. Till then, Shalom. So if I have at any point in my life accepted Christ into my life as Lord and Savior, said the salvation prayer. Irrespective of how I've lived my life on earth, you are saying that I am going to spend eternity with God. The condition for spending eternity with God is to receive Christ. But don't forget, once you receive Christ, his nature comes in your inside and his nature begins to transform your mind. You know, the issue we're dealing with here is the transformation of the mind because the spirit is already saved. But the mind undergoes transformation. So that's why in the concept of salvation, we have you are saved, you are being saved, you will be saved. You are saved, you are being saved, you will be saved. Now, you are being saved because you are saved. You will be saved because you are saved. So the foundation is that you are saved. You are being saved is the renewing of the mind. You will be saved is the is the body putting on immortality. So that's the concept of salvation. But your, your body will receive immortality because you're already saved. Your mind will be renewed because you're already saved. So salvation 
is eternal once you receive Christ. And you know, that is what Christianity offers that other religions don't offer. The assurance of salvation. Once you are saved, there's an assurance. That assurance is a guarantee. That guarantee is the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls him the down payment of salvation. So the, the, the point is this. You don't give birth to a baby and dump the baby on the road to grow. A pastor cannot just lead you to Christ and abandon you. If he does that, he didn't do his job. That's why the word in the Great Commission is make disciples. Go and make disciples. The word matter to you. Go and turn men into students. So the job of a pastor begins with getting people saved. But that's just the introduction. The real work is transforming men by teaching them what happened to them when they got saved. And that can take a lifetime. But if a Christian received the gospel, received Christ, and then nobody helped him, and he went back home and went back to his former ways. Because there's a lot of prayer going on in the church for people that are saved to grow, to be transformed. Somehow, somehow, Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. He will navigate that person somehow, somehow. He will stumble on somebody or stumble on a teaching or stumble on a relationship that will provoke his appetite for spiritual growth. And that's where teaching begins. What now happens to the place of the wages of sin is death. I'm a believer, but I have not let go of the ways of sin. You know, some of us believe we can put one leg here, one leg there. What then happens in the afterlife where, you know, I've been living in sin as a Christian, I died. What now happens to that context of one sin, eternally sin? Am I going to heaven in spite of all this? So there are two things. The first thing is, there are people who are in churches who say they are saved, but they are false brethren, false. The Bible also teaches about false believers, false brethren, false believers. What made them false? The message they had. They didn't hear the true gospel and they believe they are saved, but they are not saved. So such people will live in sin and it doesn't matter because they are not even saved. But a child of God that is truly saved of God, you have the life of God. Even if you sin, you will know that something is wrong. Even if you sin, you cannot enjoy it because that's not your natural habitation you don't belong there so every time you get into sin or you commit an act of sin in your spirit you will know that you step into a territory where you don't belong and you cannot be comforted okay so that is why they say bible says the love of christ constrains us there's that constraint that constraint but the question i also want to ask you Mia, is is there actually anybody on earth that is without sin absolutely not there's not because once you have this mortality and that's why this mortality will have to be changed because this mortality is subject to all kinds of things. If you don't commit fornication, which is the, what Christians call sin, is all, Christian sin is always fornication, adultery, and uh, murder. Lying, self, you don't call it lying. Then it's a white lie. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an issue. So there's nobody that is without sin because sin is not classified. It's only when you classify sin, you start seeing those that, are, that have no sin. There's no body because of this body. If you don't sin by looking, you sin by hearing, you sin by thinking, you sin by acting. There are all kinds of sins. So that's why the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us. There's an ongoing cleansing work in the advocacy of Christ that ensures the believer is constantly washed. So that sin can never stand between God and the believer. Because there's a work, the advocacy of Christ that takes care of the believer's sins. First John chapter 1 verse 9. Where he says, if any say you have no sin, you make God a liar and the truth is not in you. He was talking to the agnostics. These are people in church. They dress, they talk, they sing, they dance, they even speak in tongues. But they are not saved. They are false bread. But if a man is genuinely saved and has experienced Christ and he sins, he will know. Because it's a witness of the spirit in the believer. The spirit that bears witness that you are a child of God. That witness will tell you, uh -uh, you don't belong there. Mm -mm, you're in the wrong place. And he makes you uncomfortable. It's like the pig and the sheep. When a pig falls in mud, the pig is very comfortable and happy. But when a sheep falls in mud, it begins to scream until you bring it out. That's the difference. Because of the nature of God in you, even when you see, you will know that I've just moved into a territory I don't belong. It, that's why Jesus gave the illustration of the prodigal son, the parable. The boy was eating with pigs and then he said, mm, no, I don't belong here. How many hired servants does my father have? Enough to eat and to spare. What am I doing here? I will arise and go home. Nobody spoke to him. But that knowing in him, and that's what happens to the believer. The, the believer gets caught up in a wrong in a wrong environment and is doing what he's not supposed to do. Suddenly, something that trigger goes in goes off within him and he goes like, mm, I don't belong here. Mm. 
and he gets out of it. That's the difference. The unbeliever, the man that is a false brother or a false convert will be very happy that he's having a good time mm. and will devise even ways to continue having a good time because there's no conviction, no inward witness of the spirit in his inside. So the, and, you know, he said, go away. I know you not. What's, what's, what's in that? Still in the context of what? So take note of, I knew you not. Mm -hmm. That means me and you never met. You never got saved. We never met. He will honor his name because he's compassionate towards the people who need the miracle. Mm. Doctor, let me, let me, is it possible that the Holy Spirit leaves a man and he's not giving instruction again? The Holy Spirit will never leave nor forsake you. That's what Jesus said. He will abide with you forever. That's why salvation is eternal. Because the seal of salvation is the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He has sealed us with the Holy Ghost of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession. The purchased possession is your body. So the Holy Ghost is going to stay with you no matter what until this body puts on immortality. That's why salvation is secure. You know, the only, the only faith on earth, the only faith on earth where the worship lives on the inside of the worshiper is Christianity. Why does the worship lives on the inside of the worshiper? To secure the worshiper. So in light of one saved forever saved, what then do we do as Christians that deny us of eternal life? Now, you see the life? Eternal. Eternal life. Not temporal life. Mm. Eternal. Remember, you have no life. Except for that. Except the life. You have no life. Okay. When Christ who is our life, mm. so you have no life. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ. So because you have no life, the life you have is eternal. You can't lose it. Okay, so let me ask you that, layman. What can I do that will deter me from making heaven? Because of the, the context of heaven and hell in the afterlife. You cannot make heaven. No human being can make heaven. That teaching of making heaven is a scam. It's not Bible. There is nowhere the Bible, check your Bibles. There's nowhere the Bible ever said that when the believer dies, he goes to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Check it. But, but the Bible talks about judgment after that. I'm yeah. coming now. But he doesn't talk about going to heaven. He talks about judgment. Yes, there's judgment. What judgment? Two judgments. The first judgment is the great white throne judgment for unbelievers. For the believer, it is the beamer seat, the judgment seat of Christ. But the reason why you'll be judged in the judgment seat of Christ is because you are in Christ. The great white throne judgment is a judgment for those who rejected the gospel. The other judgment is for believers, for service, for work, for ministry, for the things you did in the kingdom of God. You will be judged so you can be rewarded. That one doesn't have to do with the loss of salvation. It's a reward. It's family business. So the father will gather his family and say, you, what did you do? Check it. You didn't do well. You, take your reward. That one is for family. You don't lose your sonship because of the judgment seat of Christ. You are still a son, but you won't be rewarded. But the white throne judgment is for those who had the gospel and rejected the gospel. And that judgment is for them to be sent to their final destination. Since they don't want Christ, of course, they have to go to, to where is available outside Christ. But all those who rejected Christ will, will spend eternity with Satan. They will spend eternity with Satan. Because the only option outside Christ is Satan. So since you don't want Christ, he's not going to force you. That's why I say God doesn't send people to hell. It is people's choices that take them to hell. God will never send you to hell. But if you say, God, I don't want you, then God is not a tyrant. He's a father. He will let you have your way. But the absence of God is hell. So Alright, for me it is quite important that we talk on some of the things that were raised in the video. I will try as much as possible not to waste time. The, the talk or the remark that heaven at last is a scam is a bit preposterous, is a bit um, unwise to say because it is not true. In John chapter 14 verse 1 to 3, Jesus tells the disciples, You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return and take you unto myself. So that wherever I am, there you might be also. So to the child of God, the heaven of the child of God is the abode of eternal rest. And I, you know, in this instance, heaven can be atmospherical. Now, heaven is real and hell is real. So wherever Jesus will be on that day is our heaven. And the Bible says that thus shall we ever be with the Lord. When the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place, where will it take place? So, heaven is real. It might be above us, beyond the cloud, wherever. We don't know specifically where this heaven is. Yes, and I might say heaven is above where God lives. 
And that is what the Bible says. So saying that heaven at last, you know, well, making heaven is a scam. Uh, is a choice of word that is a bit, I mean, unnecessary. So um, without bothering you so much, let us actually start from the last question that was asked, you know, and the, the lady asking the question was asking those questions, I believe out of concern. I believe out of also uh, disbelief and alarm over this issue of eternal salvation. Now we're going to look at certain scriptures here. When you know the 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 concept, the concept is that once one believes in Christ, there is no possibility of going back. There's no possibility of backsliding. We've had this discussion even offline that so many people believe that you cannot backslide as a Christian, that it is not possible. It is not possible. And when you talk about Demas, now the 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 immediate confrontation you will receive will be that Demas was never saved in the first place, agreeing with his own notion of false believers and false brethren, which is true. We know that there are false believers, there are false brethren. Uh, but Apostle Paul knew Demas. How then did Apostle Paul not know that Demas was not saved? Then it is we who were not there, we were not there. And I don't know any of us who can be more spiritual and more spirit-filled than Apostle Paul. And Apostle Paul never reported to us that Demas was never saved. But he told us that he has departed, he has forsaken me, having loved this present world. There are scriptures that we're going to look at. Yeah, it is true that... Um, you don't give a birth to a baby and abandon the baby halfway. But it is also true that it is a heartbreaking, you know, thing to give a birth to a baby and the baby sit that baby for life. You two will get at some point in time, you will see that the baby is not ready to move on in life. And even Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1, you know, hinted at us not staying at a particular place for too long. There is supposed to be a time to grow. So now pampering a sinning believer all through his life, you know, is not completely in agreement with the scriptures. All we know is that God is a merciful God. And if a child of his misbehaves and returns, yeah, he will always forgive. But then, should we take that for granted? I'm happy that he also um, acknowledged the fact that once Christ comes into the believer, now the nature of Christ comes into the believer and that gives the believer a quickening sense and he made reference to what I've been saying here, the difference between the, the, the pig and the sheep. The sheep falls into a mud and cries out for help, but then the pig loves to stay there. You may have heard me say much about that. Now, but what we look at, you know, is the possibility that this child of God who lived in sin consistently, you know, yeah, he, is, he has believed, but he lived in sin consistently. And the only thing that he will suffer is the loss of his reward, but... He will be saved. Now we're going to look at some scriptures. Now, like I said, that the notion has been that it is not possible for a believer to fall. Now we are going to start by looking at the life of Apostle Paul, he himself, who is the messenger of grace that you know everyone seems to be talking about. Now, in First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Now, for better understanding, we have to read wider. Let us uh, start from verse 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters, and we are some of them, as it is written. Neither be ye idolaters, as we are some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, before we go to 12, now you believe, and Ebedah may also believe that the coming out of the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan is a type of the believers coming out of the world into the kingdom of Christ, being saved from the world into Christ, right? So, leaving the world into Christ, they were baptized into Christ, they crossed the rest, the rest and the target was Canaan land, the promised land, Canaan, the promised land, and the Bible now is reminding us here that many of these people did not get to the promised land. Many failed to reach the promised land 
because of definitely these things that we have you know read in the bible the first book of corinthians chapter 10 from verse 6 now remember my place of emphasis is in verse 12 now verse 12 says wherefore let him that think it is standard take heed lest he fall now remember that the person who is talking here is apostle paul now he is actually telling the believers to be very very careful very very careful that it is possible for the things that happened to the brethren the the israelites who were brought out from egypt and the aim was for them to get to the promised land they never got there they died you know in the wilderness perished in the wilderness some of them were were, were, were beaten by snakes some of them you know died some unnatural death some kind of painful death some died in war by the sword now the thing was that the judgment of god came upon them they died and and you see the 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 thing here is that the bible said that they were written for our own examples now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come right so he said that these things were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things that it is possible actually for the person who is standing boasting on his own you know um exploits of faith and what have you and living carelessly near the edge of sin and destruction he said wherefore let him that thinketh is standeth take heed lest he fall so there is the possibility that a child of god will fall there is the possibility of falling by a child of god now so from here we go to the the next scripture uh First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. The same Apostle Paul, the same Apostle Paul who is telling us to be careful, say you should be careful because it is possible for you to do what? To fall. Now, let us read for uh, brother understanding. Let us read from verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul said he's bringing, he brought his body under, keeping it under subjection lest he had preached to others and he himself become a castaway. Abel said that the only thing that that child of God will lose is his reward, but then he will be saved. Now, Apostle Paul here, talking about crown, talking about reward, talking about mastery, he said many run the race, but one is there is only one that is crowned, the one that gets to the line. The one who finished the race gets to the line, gets to the the end of it and he is rewarded so i do not understand how it is possible that what apostle paul is was he is speaking about here was his reward how can how can it be the same thing when he was afraid of being a cast away if if the person is saved but his reward is not given to him he, he cannot use the word the language cast away because that person he was not cast away you're cast away from christ definitely it is the same thing as matthew chapter 7 verse 21 where jesus said depart from me you workers of iniquity for i knew i knew you not cast away depart from me you workers of iniquity so apostle paul at the height that he has reached was yet careful so that he will not be a cast away and in matthew chapter 24 verses 13 and 14 the lord jesus after outlining several events and the pains and sorrows and pangs that possibly God's children will face, said that he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, not even sin now. There is the possibility that the trials and troubles of this life will pummel a child of God and he gives way. Remember the, the parable of the sower, that those that were affected, all of them received the word and all of them gladly received the word but some the thing well you know had no root some cares of this life shook the word that they received some the word entered immediately you know the the uh, the birds of the air took it away they were distracted but there were few that got rooted and they bore fruit all right so jesus here in matthew chapter 24 said that it is only those that endure till the end that shall be saved those that did not allow anything, either fleshly or whatever, to distract them, 
that shall endure, I mean, that shall be saved. And if you look at the Lord Jesus himself talking, you know, to the angel of uh, one of the angels in, of the church in Revelation chapter 3, you know, that happened in verse uh, 16. But let us look, let's let's take it from verse uh, from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Do you see that? No man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall no more, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that, I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold or nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Now it is possible for this verse to be added to it, and then somebody will say, yes, those who were the poor, that mean the fake believers that Eber Damina talked about. But how can the person that Jesus was already having in his mouth be called a false believer? Definitely this person has believed. He's a believer already. But he he was neither here nor there. He will dine with the, with the, with the devil today and, you know, dine with, with, uh, you know, with Jesus tomorrow. So he is he's one leg in Christ, the other leg in the world. Today he is holy. Tomorrow he is unholy. Today he is pure. Tomorrow he is impure. He is committed today. The next day he is not. And Jesus warned, I will spew you out of my mouth. I will cast you out of me. Remember again, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. For I never knew you. Your activities was not recorded with me. They will say, but we did it. Yeah, you did it in unrighteousness. So, now, these are the, 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 these are the things. And there... Uh, you know, the other place that, you know, uh, people uh, of this belief hate to, you know, talk about is Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12, um, we read, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God, verse 13, which worketh in you both to will, and to do of his good pleasure, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that, it may, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea! Let's stop at verse 16. Work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. Yes, it is God that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That is what the grace, the teaching grace of salvation, or the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ does. He saves us, forgives us, enables us, and teaches us to be responsible and not to be irresponsible. Now, because God, as Abel rightly admitted, God is not a tyrant and he will not force his will on us. So also we have come to him. He will in no wise cast us away, but we can decide not to stay. We can decide not to remain just like Demas decided not to remain and he left. And just like, you know, now anybody who doesn't want to stay, Jesus will not, you know, worry the person, will not force the person to stay. If you don't want to stay, I cast you out. I spew you out. Not because I want to, but because that is what you desire so much to. So have your way. For though they knew God and they retained him not in their in their understanding, in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind, right? So working out your own salvation with trembling and fear. Apostle Paul said, I put my body under. There is nobody without sin. That is true. Even the most the most righteous of men on his own, that righteousness is filthy. But the yieldedness of the mind of that believer to the authority of Christ is what matters that is what we are talking about is what matters now you know that the holy spirit stays forever the bible told us that we should not grieve the holy spirit ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 and do not grieve the holy spirit of god ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, it is not, you know, so to speak that immediately we grieve the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit lives. But if the eyes of the Lord is so pure that he cannot behold iniquity, I believe that once we grieve the Holy Spirit and we go into sin, the Holy Spirit is grieved, he turns. You see, the Lord God turned his back on Jesus, his son, when Jesus was made sin for our sake. And so because God could not look upon that sin on on Jesus, not that Jesus committed sin, that God momentarily turned his back. Now, but how come, how about if we now consistently keep grieving the Holy Spirit, keep the grieving the Holy Spirit, keep grieving the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus, you know, talked about the offense against the Holy Spirit. And when the children of Israel were leaving, you know, the wilderness into the, 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 the promised land, the Lord warned them about the angel of his presence, that they should be wary of him, lest they offend him lest they grieve him even the lord jesus himself so um not dwelling on this so much i just want you you see i've not come to force you to believe all these things but read the bible also and consider these things yourself i believe that by the grace of god you would come to an understanding of what the spirit of god is talking about abel did so well in some of the answers he gave but yet this point is very very misleading and if you are sincere to yourself since you have started believing this thing you see you are becoming less concerned less careful about the things you do you you know you were afraid to lie before but these days you you discover that you can easily lie because you know oh we cannot live without sin all right just like somebody who takes the grace of god the message of god for granted uh, let me just let me just do this after I ask God for forgiveness. Will God forgive? Yes, he will forgive. He will forgive. But the dangers in it is, should we not continue in sin that grace may abound? The Bible said, God forbid, how shall we? How is it possible that we, who have left the world and its you know, pleasure behind, how is it possible? Now, the, 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 the fact that First John was written to the uh, agnostics, strange honestly it is strange because apostle john was referring to his little children so that letter was written to the you know group of churches around that time it was not specifically written to a particular church like apostle paul would write to the church in ephesus the you know the, the, the corinthian churches and all that he wrote that i mean apostle john wrote to the brethren, to the group of churches that were around, and he referred to them little children. And he started by admonishing them, even talking about the Antichrist, the Antichrist, you know, teachers that though they claimed they they, they, they they were from us, but they were not they were not part of us. And 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 he, you know, he was using we, we. So that that cannot be said to be a letter written to others. But it is not an open debate, it's not open for debate or for argument you have the bible read and whatever convictions you have may the lord settle you in the name of jesus and may the lord give you understanding in the mighty name of jesus christ thank you and uh, god bless you see you in the next video till then from me to you shalom mm -hmm.